you have found what lights you up. I'm your host, Sunny the Life Coach, and I'm here because I see you searching for something or someone out there to help you feel better, something to take away the pain that you're feeling, the inadequacies. I know all of the things that happen in life can leave you feeling empty. Your search is over. This podcast is all about finding your own freedom and power to love yourself enough to shine in the ways you were always meant to, the ways in which you are already fully capable of. If you're ready for some real talk, some serious truth bombs, and a few F-bombs, you are in the right place. Let's do this. Let's get lit. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Channeling my inner John Oliver today. (laughs) I'm glad you're here whenever or wherever you are listening. Welcome. I have been thinking a lot about deconditioning lately. It has come up with clients, peers, in group calls, even through comments on my social posts. And I'm realizing that I talk a lot about our conditioning, but not so much about how we got here all fully conditioned with our beliefs about ourselves and others, or how to do the really hard work of deconditioning. Now, this is a bit of a beast because it is ingrained in us. It has become a part of who we are. Our very identity has been shaped by our conditioning. And I will be fully transparent here and let you know that it typically takes more than a single podcast episode to get you going on your journey. However, my plan today is to give you just enough of a taste that perhaps you will want to come further into my sphere and connect a little more often and in different ways than just listening in every week. Stick with me to the end of this episode. I promise it won't be too long. And I will explain the ways in which we can explore those connections. I have new things on the immediate horizon. So stick around. If you happen to catch episode 117, which I recently published on breaking the cycles of destructive family behavior, you may wonder where I'm going with this one today. Well, it is somewhat related for sure. In that episode, I did touch on some of the childhood traumas that we have experienced and how they impact our entire lives and our relationships. Part of having this conversation about deconditioning includes reframing the way that we view trauma. We have all had traumatic experiences in our lives. And some of us may have been through abuse or neglect or an accident, a near-death experience, war, the loss of a loved one that wasn't through natural causes, violence, horrible things, right? We can all agree these are horrible experiences that we would rather have not encountered. These are generally understood and accepted traumas. I'm talking about just in general society, right? Most of us would agree on that. And as I have discussed here before with my friend Lisa Schwartz, who works in trauma centers, is that recently I have been hearing with more frequency of this trauma distinction, big T and little t and the designations that are given. So I just named off some traumatic experiences that would likely be labeled as big T. It's the big stuff, right? But as Lisa explained in that episode, and that's episode 98 if you want to check it out or refresh your memory. As she explained in that episode, it doesn't even matter what the event itself was. What makes it a big deal or a small one is how it appears in your body, what it does to your nervous system, how you end up rewiring your brain in response to the trauma, which is a threat to your existence, right? That's how your brain views it. And your brain is going to leap into self-preservation mode and ensure that you are safe. It's going to adjust the way that it processes things. You might change your behavior as a result of a major event. Sure, 
you may change the circles in which you travel or the places that you go. We get that. We expect that with the larger life events that we all recognize as being traumatic for most humans. And I say most because I never want to imply that we would all respond in the same manner or that there is a certain timeline to heal or that there is a certain way to process trauma. I definitely want to highlight and honor our uniqueness. So I'm with Lisa and I don't like to label or make distinctions around trauma because also, as we discussed, those events perceived as little T's don't get a lot of airtime, but they can also mean death by a thousand cuts, and they can also reshape your very identity. So let's talk about some of those little cuts today, because in episode 117, that's where I kind of talked about the quote unquote big stuff, right? We're going to talk about those little cuts today. Recently, I shared that I was ridiculed in seventh grade for the way that I held my pencil. So much so that I gave in and changed the way that I held my pencil so it would stop. So the other kids would stop calling me weird and wrong. I changed my identity in seventh grade. I was no longer a person who held her pencil between her index and middle finger. It was wrong. That meant that I was wrong. I didn't want to be wrong, so I changed. I wanted to be liked or at the very least accepted, right? And I knew when I shared it that so many people would be able to see the subtle and not so subtle ways in their own lives, the ways that they have been conditioned by their environments and downright encouraged, if not forced to, actually surrender a part of themselves. Y'all, that's a really big deal. And it's traumatic. We shrug it off in the moment because we don't want to make too much noise. Especially women, that has been drilled into us on a societal level for generations to be ladylike and polite and all that business. When we do this, we fail to see the impact that it has had on us. So that's what I want you to explore today as many of my friends shared their own experiences. And I'll be honest, I wasn't quite prepared for the number of people who were naturally left-hand dominant, who were forced by their parents or teachers to learn to write with their right hand. That was a recurring theme, and I honestly can't imagine. This has even been going on for generations. One friend noticed her son was a lefty, and realized as a toddler she saw that and realized that both his father and grandfather had been born lefties and forced to switch. Now she said this gives them the benefit of being very ambidextrous today but still just wow it just never occurred to me to do that as a parent. That's crazy. But that's where the generational cycles do overlap with this topic because it takes some of us some time to figure out that we don't have to do it the same way our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents did. We don't have to have zero tolerance for lefties. I'm not even sure where that came from. Fear, perhaps? Fear of being different? Fear of being ridiculed in seventh grade? Listen, here's what no one really tells you. We all get ridiculed in seventh grade. No one gets out of seventh grade unscathed. If it hadn't been about my pencil grip, they would have found something else, guaranteed. And of course they did. I mean, the way I dressed and my inability to sport the latest name brand sneakers were also fair game. As a result, when I was older, I put a lot more thought into my clothes and my hair and my appearance in order to be accepted. Well, that was my personal goal anyway. You can't force acceptance. But apparently you can force a left-handed child to use his or her right hand instead. I just genuinely wonder what goes into something like that when it's coming from parents and teachers. What does that look like as the conditioning is taking place? 
Was there yelling? Were there punishments? Were they grounded at home or made to stand in the corner at school for not complying? Were they beaten? See what I'm saying here? What did the process look like to literally reprogram a human who has a natural left dominance? But how much of that process are you still holding in your nervous system? Do you still believe that you are wrong? Yes, some of these quote unquote lighter traumas, if you will, are actually encased in the heavier stuff, like getting a beating for not minding your parents, using the wrong hand. And yes, some of these lighter traumas end up having big impacts that we can't even see. Now, I'm not trying to substitute as your therapist here. If you know your traumas and want to explore them for healing, definitely seek therapy. What I'm talking about are the ways that they show up in your life currently and how being able to see where it came from can help with the deconditioning process, which I will get to in a minute. I just want to give one more example first because another story share was around food. And I've heard this several different ways from different friends or clients over the years, and every version of this is just as sinister as the next. Picture a seven-year-old girl at a group luncheon, and her grandmother walks over to her, plucks the roll from her plate, and tells her that she can't have two carbs. She already had a baked potato. Can't have both. She was seven, and it set her up for a lifetime of a disconnected relationship with food. It made her hide, and it made her feel ashamed that she loves carbs. Well, I'm getting emotional on this one. I'm just getting emotional with the whole visual of it all, of a seven-year-old. And I know that so many of you listening already can probably relate to that. And she's now in her 60s. And while she no longer hides, she still thinks of that moment often. And this may not have been her only experience, but it is her first memory of food shaming. And it's the most damaging for her because she literally had food taken from her plate. Talk about creating a scarcity mindset. In this example, It only took one single event, one minute over a whole lifetime to almost instantly condition her around what her eating habits should be. She couldn't be herself. She couldn't be the girl who loves carbs. I tell you these stories because I want you to have examples of what I'm talking about here and I also want you to be inspired to find what you are still holding on to that needs to be released what needs to be deconditioned. Sometimes these are our blind spots and it takes coaching and just the right questions to uncover what the root of the problem really is. I know I've been coached on several things that it took a few sessions to really work out. Oh, that's why this is coming up. So we may not even recall a specific event. It's just a knowing that I used to love this, or I used to be that way, but now I'm different. Do you like who you've become? Chances are, if it was your choice to change, you're probably feeling pretty good about where you are. But if you changed because of someone else, where you were convinced or forced to change, then you might have some bitterness to work through. Well, it's time to get better, not bitter. Let's do things better. Let's start within. I'm going to give you a simple formula that will help you to decondition and step into the person you were truly meant to be, not someone else's vision of you, who you want to be. Three things. Question, identify, release. Let's explore those. Question, where? Is it coming from? Why am I doing it this way? Why am I behaving this way? Do I still want to? 
All right, I said I was done with stories, but this isn't my story. It is a fun one that you may have heard as I've heard it a few times from various sources, but it is such a great example. I really want to include that here in the questioning part. And the story is told of a woman who brought home a leg of ham and was preparing it for Christmas dinner. And she proceeded to cut it in half before placing it in the oven to cook it. And her husband was watching and asked, why do you cut it in half? Is that so it cooks better in the middle? And his wife paused for a moment and then answered, I don't really know. That's just what I've always done. I saw my mother doing it when I was a little girl. So later, the in-laws arrived for Christmas dinner and the question was brought up, Mom, why did you cut the leg of ham in half before placing it in the oven to cook? I don't really know, her mother replied. Your grandma used to do that. So it's just something I've always done. There must be a reason for it. Later, the family all traveled to grandma's house that evening. During a lull in the conversation, the wife asked her grandmother, Grandma, why did you teach mom to cut the leg of ham in half before cooking it? Well, replied the grandmother, when your mother was a girl, my oven was very small and I couldn't fit the whole leg in without cutting it in half. Oh, this is so perfect, right? You see, sometimes we just carry our behaviors on for generations without even asking the most basic questions. Sometimes that conditioning comes from a simple observation and no words were even spoken. The questioning part is going to get you to where you want to be. That is the goal. So the second one was identify. Identify the source of the behavior if you can. What's most important in this step is that you are identifying what no longer serves you. I'm guessing a couple of generations of women might be no longer cutting their holiday ham in half since they realized that it is unnecessary. What's unnecessary for you? I'm not changing the way I hold my pencil at this point. I'm here to tell you, that ship has sailed. However, one of the things I have identified in myself that no longer serves me is hiding from what I'm afraid of. I don't need to do that anymore. I don't need to pretend to be anyone except who the fuck I am. That's definitely inner child territory right there. Finally, release those old stories. Let them go. You don't need to carry them anymore. You don't need to sport those scars. And also realize all of that bitterness and resentment. Remember, your parents and your grandparents and your great-great-grandparents were only doing the best they could with what they knew. Recognize that change is inevitable. But one of the hardest things for humans to do is accept that society around them has changed and adjust accordingly. We're seeing that happen in real time, aren't we? We're seeing it happen. So many people just want a return to the good old days or simpler times or whatever it is that they loved about the lives they had when they were younger. They tend to recreate those experiences and behavior patterns with their own children. Sometimes it's even without awareness. It's just subconscious, like I notice mom always cuts the ham, so I guess how it's that's how it's done. But you aren't doing that business of recreating experiences and behavior patterns with your own children because you are a cycle breaker and you are willing to release the old stories that say left-handed kids are doing it wrong. They're actually doing life wrong. That's the story. Release it let it go. That's not who you are anymore. The only thing you have left to prove is to yourself that you are capable of such transformation. And when you get to the place where you can release your hold on those old stories, it also increases your capacity to love others unconditionally. And if you have been listening for a while or you know me, you'll understand that unconditional love is a central theme to finding our own inner light and achieving our own inner peace. As Rumi says, come out of the circle of time 
and into the circle of love. Yeah, you know, there is also a saying that time heals all wounds. Maybe that's true for some things, but I don't believe that it's true for all things. Not only time. Remember, we're all unique, and a big part of our ability to heal is encased in our ability to even recognize what it is that we need to heal from. Maybe you don't yet have an awareness of the source of your pain. Maybe you do. Either way, we can find it together and get to the business of transforming the way that we experience this life. Thank you for staying all the way to the end. I do want to announce that I'm kicking off a five-day experience in a few weeks that is going to be all about how to decondition ourselves from these childhood experiences. I will not have the sign-up link ready until next week, but if you follow me on social media, I will announce it there soon on both Facebook and Instagram. The very first place it's going to be introduced is in the What Lights You Up Facebook group. So if you haven't joined that new group yet, be sure to check show notes for the link. We are already having some fantastic conversations there around the very topics that I've been sharing here with you. It's been a while since I have done a live event, so I'm absolutely stoked to bring you this one. Based on what I'm seeing and hearing, this is something you all just might appreciate. It will be the week of July 25th, if you would like to mark your calendars. More details as the date draws closer. And if you're catching this after the fact, come on over and join the Facebook group anyway, because that's where I will be sharing whatever I might have going on in the future. Yes, I am speaking to the listeners of the future today who will be hearing what I have said in the past. Wild! Again, it's not possible to go to the depths of what most of us need from one single podcast episode. I've given you some surface level ideas to run with for now, but join me on July 25th. Join me at a later date or sign up to have a free conversation because that's where the rubber really meets the road. Until then, light up and shine on.